and stories inform us to what is possible. Stories influence us to what is needed. And stories inspire us to what could be. Stories happen when people live their life to the fullest. These are the storytellers. Welcome to Storytellers, where we look into the businesses that are owner-operated that fulfill a very specific niche, the occupations that people just love, or the vocations that give them some very self-fulfilling and fulfilling for other people's needs. Today, we're with Thomas Freilinger, the owner of Thomas Jewelries in Gallatin, Tennessee. The reason why I'm interviewing Thomas is he has a very unusual niche market here. He customizes jewelry. I met him a few years ago. I had bought my wife a clatter ring and if for those of you that don't know what it is it's two hands being held over a heart and my wife didn't like wearing two rings on the same finger the engagement ring and the clatter ring being the wedding band and I asked Thomas if he could do something about that and on the film here you'll see what he did from a plain clatter ring to a this is what he created. I also found out that Thomas has done this for other people and other types of jewelry. So today we're going to find out the behind the scenes. We're going to pull the curtain back on jewelry. It's a very unusual business. Thank you Thomas for having given us this time to meet with you. How did you get into the jewelry business? My wife actually worked for a jeweler when we were in college. And a few years after we graduated college, I, I was friends with him and he got me into it. You were in college, so your degree was in something else? Chemistry. Chemistry. And yes. from, from, chemist, from drugs to jewels? Yes, I was a pharmaceutical chemist and that's what I graduated to do. But it didn't, I didn't really care for it very much and there are a lot of similarities between the two industries. Really? How's that? A lot of precious metals are used in the manufacturing of drugs. I didn't know And that. there's a whole refining aspect to it and all of that. My knowledge of metals and metallurgy made it easy for me to shift into the jewelry industry because I already knew a lot about these precious metals. Did this gentleman that you, he was your you were a protege to him. Did he do customized work like you do now, or was he? Yes. He did? Yes. It, well, he himself is no longer with us, uh, but a man that he introduced me to is still working in Philadelphia, which... Is same where, store? Uh, no, not same store, just different store. He introduced me for training to this guy, and that, that guy's still there. He's a diamond setter in Philadelphia. Do you actually cut stones here? No. That's a completely separate art. So your fat your your part in the jewelry business, what because you do have you have degrees on the wall here, I can see that. What what are they in? Uh, for basically for appraising. Okay. Jewelry, uh, diamond, you know, their diamondology, that kind of stuff. Is there a certification program that you go through, a schooling, an, an official schooling? There is. Uh, GIA is the Gemological Institute of America. That is the preferred place where a lot of people should go to get degrees in gem identification, appraising, things like that. It's called a graduate gemology degree. Where's that located at? Carlsbad, California. Did you go out there? No. You can do it online. And they have satellite campuses throughout the country that they'll be at, and you can do your practicals uh, like in Atlanta or places like that when you have to. But most of it you can do online. I was in here the other week picking up my wife's Valentine's Day gift. By the way, um, Thomas's daughter, Tess, phenomenal artistic person. She has a real sense of um, what people are going to like. <laughs> anyway, she got me into the... Uh, what, Black Gold? Black Hills Gold. Black Hills Gold. Uh, and uh, So far I've 
bought three different pieces of jewelry for my wife and she just absolutely loves them. But getting back to, um, I was in here the other week picking up and there was a person in here and you told them, I forget which type of stone it was, a sapphire is really this other, because it's a certain color, it's another name, a ruby. Sapphire and ruby are really the same stone. One is red, one is blue. It's a, a mineral called corundum. And that's what it's made out of. And there are many colors in between, like pink and, you know, all the way through. And they're called like a pink sapphire. Pink sapphire. When it gets ruby red, that's when it's called a ruby. Is that an aging process or just the makeup in... Just the makeup in, in, in nature. I've noticed with gold, like um, people from India, when they've got gold on, it's a very dark, vibrant gold as opposed to the gold that we have. What's that difference there? There's this higher carrot. Carrot spelled with a K. Okay. Let's see. Um, 24 carat is pure gold coming out of the ground. 18 carat is 75% gold, 25% alloy. 14 carat is 58% gold. 42% alloy, and 10 carat is 41.7% gold, which is pretty much as low as you should go, and the rest is alloys. So the higher the carat, the higher the gold content, and the deeper it looks. Most people from the middle or from India, places like that, Pakistan, they like 21, 22 carat gold, hmm. almost pure. That's the, the real color that it is when it comes out of the ground. Now I've been told that uh, gold in its pure form is very very soft. It's soft, yes. It's very malleable. You can bend it easily. You can mold it and work with it easily. So when you add the alloy it into hardens it, it. it, it hardens it so it's less chance of losing its... Yes. Okay, but you lose that color. You lose the color. It goes more yellow. You were talking to someone the other day also when I was in here. There's so many people that come in the store and they're having this customized or that customized. By the way, what's the most unusual request that you've had in your career as a jeweler? I made a ring with two butterflies on each side and their wings holding a pearl with a diamond set into the pearl. Into the pearl. Into the pearl. It was a, a large Tahitian pearl, and we drilled a hole and dug a hole out, and then we set the diamond down into the pearl. So that's that's the most unusual. Oh, that's got to be. That is? That's got to be. Yeah, I mean, the wings were holding the pearl, and it was an engagement ring. She was going, she was studying to be, he wanted to propose, and she was studying to be a butterfly scientist really he proposed down in the butterfly museum or the atrium down in atlanta to her one of the customers that came in here last week she she was in here and she brought four different pieces of jewelry and she wanted some very specific things done and that's when i found out that you had an engraving machine here and she wanted some engraving done and and i brought up the question I didn't know you had an engraving machine to do all jewelry stores because it seems when you go to the big box places, right. they have to send it away. But yes. you've got the engraver here. Yes. But you also pointed something out to me and you said the engraving machine will never take the place of the artist. No. A Tell hand, me. hand engraving is, it's just, it's much better. It, 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 the human being, the human mind and your hands, a machine cannot replicate that. You just can't. So anytime you can get something hand done, it's just, it looks and feels like it's done by a human, not a, not a machine. Mm -hmm. Machines do things perfectly. Humans don't. But humans also make, when you are manufacturing a piece and you're doing it by hand your mind and your hands can make micro decisions and compensate for different things that come up where a machine is just going to make it exactly the same way every single time and that's one of the the tricky parts 
about jewelry is if you're going to make it with a machine, try to make it look handmade. Okay. All right, because... Which means there's going to have to be some inconsistencies? Well, it, not just inconsistencies, but we cookie cutter stuff. Uh, machines do corners and rounds and everything perfect. So everything, like if you look in uh, your big box stores, you will see these halos and they're just, they're perfect squares. And we call it flow in the jewelry industry. The ring has to have flow on the person's finger. Well, if it's perfectly square, perfectly block, it, they kind of tend to look blocky okay. a little bit. Whereas if you make it by hand, you know what the person is going to be wearing it on, what finger she's going to be wearing it on. All of that, you can compensate and you can soften. So when you're doing a piece with a machine, you try and make the machine soften the corners, soften the edges, round everything off a little bit, make it look more handmade. Kind of goes with your slogan. Yes. Creating today's heirlooms. Creating tomorrow's, tomorrow's heirlooms. Creating tomorrow's heirlooms. That's right. That's what we're trying to do. That lady had a, was it her son or son-in-law to be, because she asked for a, an American flag to be made out of rubies, I believe. Uh, she's. Uh, it's going to be for her husband. And he was. he's a war veteran. And she's going to have his, the colors of the American flag put into his man's ring. Oh, okay. All right, so we're going to do it with stones. They're red, white, and blue in stones all throughout his ring and make it look nice. You also said there'll be different size stones and they should be placed very specifically in relation to the other size. Yes. So there would be, and you used that terminology last week, there'd be a flow to it. There'll be a flow. Everything has to have a flow. So it looks good when a person wears it, and it looks good to other people who see it. What could people, I know what they can get, but I want you to tell them. I come here because I like buying my wife very unique, customized things. What can you provide that the big box stores can't? Tell me. We really don't send out any of our repairs. We do them mostly all in-house. Uh, we also provide, we think, a superior customer service. Um, we have jewelry that they do not have. Most of our jewelry is either made by us or friends of mine that supply. And it's something you won't necessarily see, but we don't sell warranties on jewelry. You just have one because the jewelry should not fall apart from the beginning. It should be made well enough to, so we back our product. It's not an add-on like everything else. No, it's not. No. And that just, it flies all over me. I'll go buy a refrigerator someplace and I'll say, do you want to buy the warranty too? <laughs> and I'll say, this should last longer than five years. Well, we look at that as you're paying for your own repairs up front. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's no reason to do that. You know, the, the piece should hold up, mm -hmm. you know, and there's natural wear and tear on a piece over years and years and years, and that happens to everything. But you shouldn't walk out the door and 20 minutes later the piece fall apart. It just shouldn't happen. I, you know, you hear these other commercials about diamonds and people going to Israel or South Africa to buy diamonds and the gradations and all that. What do you have to offer here as far as great quality diamonds in, in comparison to these commercials? Well, generally speaking, we only sell GIA certified stones. Okay, unless a customer asks me for something different, I'll, and I'll get it for them. GIA is the top grader in the world. There is, a, you know, there are other organizations, they'll say it's IGI or it's EGL or it's this or that. It, you, you want it to be GIA if you're going to have a certified stone. All right, because it is what they say it is. And that's, they're very tough graders. Mm -hmm. So um, we only usually supply those for people in their engagement rings. Um, and just, you know, we make the ring for the customer. 
will make the ring in her size, her finger size. So it, it truly is an individual. It's an individual piece, piece of an heirloom for that person. For that person, yes. So you know, a lot of these big box stores, they'll have a bunch of rings, but they'll all be in a size seven or an eight. But if she's a size four, that's a big jump. And that causes diamonds to fall out and everything else, and they ha inevitably have problems with the ring. And you make all of the adjustments here. Yes. Uh, this engraving machine, you said you had just got it? It is a computerized engraving machine, yes. And I just got it a couple weeks ago. And it will be able to do a lot more than just engrave. Oh, for example? Um, it'll, it'll also be able to carve into a ring if I want to put letters on the outside of a ring. Mm -hmm. If I want that to say, it can do that. So it can carve into jewelry as well. A person that might be interested in, like you got interested because of who your wife was working at mm -hmm. at, at the time, the uh, gemologist. And by the way, your wife is a certified appraiser? She is. You're, no. you're the gemologist. Well, no, I am, I'm actually a jeweler. You're the jeweler. I'm the jeweler. Uh, those certifications on the wall are my wife's. She went to school for that while she was staying home with children. But she is a high school teacher, and so she went back to teaching. Uh -huh. But the, she does, uh, she can do the appraisals if she wants here. I can do the appraisals. I just can't say I'm a certified GIA appraiser. So she you might is. have to sign off on you. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. <laughs> She, she signed off on one. For certain insurance companies that require that, she'll sign off. Okay. All right. You are full service here, aren't you? Yes, we are. What would you suggest to a young person, and this was the original intent, um, that would be possibly interested in getting into jewelry? What would that young person um, do initially to, to just investigate? I suggest you work at a jewelry store and work at a mom and pop jewelry store not a chain um, to get a feel for what the industry's really like all right and then if you're interested in becoming a jeweler an actual jeweler patience <laughs> it takes a long long time it really does there are schools out there there's one here in tennessee um and they are good but it's very difficult to learn what a jeweler knows or has learned in the last 30 years. It's very difficult to learn that in 15 or 16 weeks. So patience, and it took a long time. I apprenticed for four to five years, and I often tell my wife I wasn't good at this until at least 15 years at it. Okay. That's how I look at it. And then after 15 years, I was pretty doggone good. As an industry, how many mom and pop stores are there left? Less all the time. We were there. They are closing down now. Amazon, big box, all that has, a, has an effect. But the jewelry industry itself is a luxury industry. So it's very difficult to get into because it requires money to get okay. into it. Or, or we got into it very, very small and just kept building and building and building. You can do it that way, but if you're going to just open a full service retail store, it's a very expensive proposition at first. So my suggestion is to start small. Is there a guild that... Not anymore in, the, in America. Used to be. There was the Jewelers Guild. And some people are trying to bring that back. There's still a Watchmakers Guild. There really is. Um, but that's dying out as well. But the Jewelers Guild went away a while ago. For people that might not know the terminology Guild, Guild is an organization that protects the quality of uh, whatever um, 
skill they're doing there's there was like you said a guild for watchmakers yes and that's that's sad that there's no longer a guild for jewelers and you said they're trying to bring it back there are uh, there are people that are very interested in bringing it back but it's very difficult to do because like a lot of things it got Americanized and uh, everybody sells jewelry now Walmart sells jewelry Every you know, Tractor Supply sells jewelry. <laughs> tractor I mean, supply. yeah, I'm walking through and there's jewelry, there's a jewelry case. You know, it's just different levels and different kinds of jewelry, and so a guild protects jewelers, actual jewelers. But there's less and less jewelers all the time. Actual jewelers. There's more retail jewelry sales, and most of the stuff is being made overseas. Really? Yes. Most of uh, the manufacturing now happens overseas for a lot of the stuff. Um, very few manufacturers left here in America. What would you tell someone that has met this very special someone and they want to give that person an heirloom? Mm -hmm. What would they look for in a store, a jewelry store, that would let them know this is going to be good stuff this is going to be quality stuff i can buy this and i don't have to worry about it you can have stuff on the wall and stuff like that but you i bet go to other towns and probably go into jewelry stores and you'll know by asking a few questions mm, they I, got it or I, they don't yeah i generally know by looking in their cases oh okay to see what type of jewelry is there and the quality of the jewelry in the cases but for a customer it's it's a very difficult thing to see it really is because jewelry looks great in the cases the quality of the manufacturing that's a tougher thing to see mm -hmm. and i can spot crooked stones and things like that in a ring where most people wouldn't notice so i can tell where it's been manufactured how it's been manufactured and all of that my suggestion is you find a local jewelry store in your market and you talk with them and you form a relationship with them. And over time and over years, you will come out so much better than you would if you were just buying at random okay. in, in a case or, you know, a sales or anything like that. Years down the line, heirlooms are going to be worth their weight, no pun intended, in gold they are. and in diamonds per se. And the quality, customized, um, protected um, of a true jeweler is going to um, prove a savings in the long run. And more importantly, is going to make something a legacy for your family. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Thank I really you. appreciate it.